Hello Behind the Knife viewers, uh, this is Michael Vu, and today we are doing some Absite Domination. Uh, so three years ago we published on YouTube our Absite Mnemonic Device Review. Um, it got some really great feedback, sounds like it's been helping you guys. Uh, looking back on it, we figured we could probably redo it since um, at the time we literally just filmed Chris Marenko uh, writing on a whiteboard. Um, so we've redone it for you, this time with a little more content in a shorter amount of time and uh, with an electronic whiteboard and none of those squeaky marker noises. Um, big shout out to Chris Marenko who did the first video. Uh, most of this material is, is his originally. All right, let's hop right to it with Chemotox Man, which we should remember from those glorious step one first aid days. We'll draw a little silhouette of a man here, and he's got ears, of course, which look like C's, and his kidneys also look like C's. And what does this represent? It represents cisplatin and carboplatin uh, ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. What else does Chemotox Man have? Well, he's got lungs, which look like bees. What does this mean? Well, this represents bleomycin and busulfan, which can produce pulmonary fibrosis. Chemotox Man has a heart, which looks like a D with a T in the middle, if we remember from first aid. This represents both doxorubicin and trastuzumab, which can produce cardiomyopathy. Chemotox Man has a bladder and genitourinary organs. It's kind of represented by this upside-down C followed by the Y. This, of course, represents cyclophosphamide, which can cause hemorrhagic cystitis. Chemotox man needs to have limbs, of course. That's represented by these Vs, and V stands for vincristine, vinblastine. That can cause peripheral neuropathy. And finally, you may remember the bones. At one end is a 5 and a 6. At the other end is the M. So this represents 5-FU, 6-mocaptopurine, and methotrexate, all of which can cause myelosuppression. Bones no work. And if you watch the old mnemonic review video, you remember Chris Marenko's little gem here, VAC. So vancomycin, aminoglycosides, and as we already mentioned, cisplatin, carboplatin. These medications all cause both nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity. All right, next, a favorite topic, pancreatic peanuts. I love this mnemonic. So let's draw the pancreas, starting with the head, represented by the G the length of the body with the sideways I, and then the tail of the pancreas with the sideways V. And of course, the spleen is hanging out over here. It's like a backwards G. So what does this tell us? Well, gastronoma, we all remember the gastronoma triangle, right? That happens at the head of the pancreas. That's that first G. Uh, insulinomas can happen anywhere in the pancreas, which is why it's that long I. VIPomas happen at the tail of the pancreas. That's why that V represents the tail. And then, uh, Glucagonomas happen also at the tail of the pancreas. That's that backwards G. And they have somatostatinomas as well. Those are found in the head of the pancreas. Not a great way to incorporate it into this mnemonic, but if you just remember to draw a little S, I guess, at the, at the, the first G there, that, that's how I remember it at least. Moving on, you want to calculate somebody's FENA, but you can't remember the equation. Well, okay, FENA equals PUP with two U's, so P-U-U-P. P times U over U times P. But of course, there are some subscripts, and what are they? Well, it's creatinine and then sodium, because the C comes before the N, right? So creatinine and sodium, and the same thing on the bottom, creatinine and sodium. That's how you calculate FENA. Next up, peptic ulcer types and their locations. Why is it so hard to remember these sometimes? Okay, so we got types 1, 2, 3, and 4, and there's a type 5, we'll get to that, but uh, here's how I remember this. So type 1, one's a small number, so lesser, you know, it's the lesser number, so the ulcer will be on the lesser curve. Type 2 uh, is like two ulcers, so those ulcers will occur both in the duodenum as well as the gastric body. Type 3, I think 3 is like pre, so a pre-pyloric ulcer. And then finally, type 4, well, 4 rhymes with door, and I think it's the door to the stomach. So these are commonly found at the gastroesophageal junction in the cardia area. And then I didn't write type 5. I think it's the easy one to remember, but those are everywhere. So, you know, it's the biggest number. It's, it's everywhere. It's associated with NSAIDs because that's a, a diffuse process. And how do you remember which ones are uh, acid secreting? Well, uh, I just remember the mnemonic MAM. So you write out M-A-A-M, -A -A and it's types 2 and 3 that have the A. So those are the types that will have hypersecretion of acid. 
All right, next, uh, thoracic outlet anatomy. You'll often be asked to uh, recall these relevant structures from anterior to posterior, from A to P. So here's the mnemonic, it's V-MAN. So V stands for your subclavian vein, M is your anterior scalene muscle, A for your subclavian artery, and then finally N for the nerves of your brachial plexus. And it kind of ruins the mnemonic a little bit, but you should probably also remember that your phrenic nerve runs on top of your uh, anterior scalene muscle, so that's why we put that extra P there. All right, bonus uh, anatomy. So what are the structures of the renal hilum from anterior to posterior? You can remember that with VAP. So V for the renal vein, uh, A for the renal artery, and then P, which stands for the renal pelvis, you know, the, the collecting system it leads to your ureter. Okay, here's a classic one from the uh, step one days, probably for you. Uh, wept, so helps you remember what warfarin does. W for warfarin, E for extrinsic pathway, and PT, meaning that's what it affects, the PTs and the INR. Next up, hypersensitivity reactions. We know that there are four types. How do you remember what does what? I like to use the mnemonic ACID, so write down ACID. And what does it stand for? So type one, A for anaphylaxis, that immediate hypersensitivity reaction that causes all that, you know, life-threatening anaphylaxis stuff. Now type 2, C, C for cytotoxic. In this kind of hypersensitivity reaction, you've got IgM and IgG antibodies binding to antigens on particular cells and causing um, cell lysis or other, you know, bad cytotoxic effects. So a lot of good examples, Graves' disease, uh, acute, you know, ABO incompatibility, hemolytic reactions, and mitasthenia gravis. Type 3, I in acid, stands for immune complex. So this is where you've got the, you know, formation and deposition of all these uh, immune complexes, basically clumps of antibodies uh, attached to antigens, and they deposit in tissues. So a good example of this would be something like lupus, or serum sickness. And last but not least, type 4 D in acid um, stands for delayed reaction. These are, these are cell mediated, T cell mediated specifically, and uh, the, the classic uh, example would be like poison ivy, but graft versus host disease and Guillain-Barre are also good examples. Okay, another classic would be uh, for treatment of symptomatic hyperkalemia, we have CB dial K. So I, I think like a CB radio, you know, it's got dials on it and, you know, K. <laughs> so uh, what does this stand for? Well, C for calcium gluconate or calcium chloride to stabilize the cardiac membrane. That should be the first thing you give um, to prevent, uh, you know, bad arrhythmias. Uh, B for high carb. D for dialysis, which should in fact be one of the last things that you do. I for insulin. Don't forget to administer it with dextrose. A for albuterol, uh, inhaled, or some other beta agonist, kind of an uncommon one. Uh, L for Lasix, or another loop diuretic. And then finally, K for k um, which works very slowly in the GI tract as a potassium binder. All right, so the next one helps you remember what electrolyte problems happen with either tumor lysis syndrome or refeeding syndrome. Okay, so for this one to work, you kind of need to know what KPMG is. It's a financial group. If, uh, if, you, if you don't know what KPMG is, I don't know, Google it, I guess, read, read all about them. They, they do like tax auditing or something. But anyway, we know that in tumor lysis syndrome, you know, the tumor cells are getting lysed, so they're spilling out all their contents. So in those situations, you'll have hyper KPMG, hyper potassium, phosphate, and magnesium. And on the other hand, refeeding syndrome, you know, the cells are, are finally getting nourished, so they're trying to suck up all these electrolytes. You'll have hypo KPMG, hypokalemia, potassium, and magnesium. All right, this next one, questionable utility, but uh, difference between quashiorcor and marasmus. They're both malnutritions, right? But one of them is a generalized calorie deficiency, and the other one is a protein deficiency. Which one is which? Well, quashiorcor has an O in it, and so it's the one with the protein deficiency. <laughs> Here's another kind of goofy one, but uh, zinc deficiency. Uh, like Chris Marenko uh, before me said, he considers it like anti-Wolverine syndrome. Um, so you will have wound healing problems and you will lose your hair. Uh, thank you for that one, Chris Marenko. 
Okay, multiple endocrine neoplasia, MEN. We know that there's types 1, 2A, and 2B. How to remember this? So in the old video, Chris actually uses a, a different mnemonic with the, with the diamond and the squares and the rectangles and whatnot. I have a different way. I start off with uh, three Ps, right? So PPP for uh, I. And then for 2A, we just take one of those Ps away, we turn it into an M, okay? And then finally for 2B, we take another P away, we turn it into an M. So men one, three Ps, what are the Ps? Well, we've got pituitary adenomas, uh, parathyroid hyperplasia, and pancreas tumors. Um, for 2A, we again have parathyroid hyperplasia, um, but now we also have pheochromocytoma as well as medullary thyroid cancer. And then finally for 2B, we have uh, pheochromocytoma again and medullary thyroid cancer, but we add that other M and it's morphinoid habitus or mucosal neuromas. So that's my way. Um, I think the shapes, you know, the, the triangles, diamonds and whatnot are, are a great way too. Uh, and so in honor of that, let's uh, see Chris Marenko's shining face again. This is how he remembers it. So in the diamond, the top vertex points at the brain for pituitary. Uh, the two side vertices are the two parathyroids. And then the bottom vertex is the pancreas. Uh, for the square, that's supposed to point to, again, the uh, parathyroids, as well as the thyroids for medullary thyroid carcinoma. And the bottom vertices are supposed to point toward the uh, adrenals. And uh, for 2B, you know, that top uh, vertex in the triangle is supposed to point toward like your mouth, I guess, uh, for mucosal neuromas. And uh, again, those bottom vertices are still representing the adrenals. And final note about the MEN syndromes, just remember that 2B, B for bad, 2B is worse than 2A. And you would want to uh, do prophylactic thyroidectomy um, earlier in, in 2B patients. Okay, moving on. So eosinophils, we may recall that they control the activation of both uh, basophils as well as mast cells. But you find basophils and mast cells uh, in different places in the body. So basophil, B for blood, you find these in the blood. And mast, uh, T, uh, that stands for tissue, like the interstitial tissues is where you find a mast cell. So you splenectomized a patient, but you can't remember what vaccines to give. Well, just remember the mnemonic SHIN. Short and sweet, uh, S stands for uh, strep pneumo, H, I for Haemophilus influenza, and N for Neisseria. All right, I think this next one's actually really useful. So we know that um, the majority of sarcomas will disseminate hematogenously, um, but there are exceptions. There are certain sarcomas that will spread to the lymphatic system. Which ones are those exceptions? Just remember the word scare because, you know, sarcoma is scary. So what does it stand for? S for synovial cell, uh, C for clear cell, A for angiosarcoma, R for rhabdomyosarcoma, and E for epithelioid. Up next is another one I, I really like. Um, so trying to remember what uh, the different congenital adrenal hyperplasias do. So at the top of your paper, write A and T, which will stand for aldosterone and testosterone. Those are like the main abnormalities that could be present. And then uh, using these columns, write down those three main types of CAH. You've got 21, 17, and 11 deficiencies. Now everywhere there's a one, you just change that into a little up arrow, okay? That's what the one will represent. So in 21 hydroxylase deficiency, you'll have increased testosterone, you know? For the 17 deficiency variant, you'll have increased aldosterone. And for the 11 variant, um, you'll have increases in both aldosterone and testosterone. But by the way, we're saying aldosterone and testosterone is a shortcut. It's not actually those exact things that are elevated in these various deficiencies. But what we mean to say is, is mineralocorticoids and androgens uh, in general. It gets a little more complicated, but we won't go so deep into those weeds. Okay, the next one's another simple kind of goofy one, but pheochromocytomas. Um, when you have like multiple surgical issues and, in, and pheo is one of them, which do you address first? Well, you should address the pheo first. And you should also make sure that the patients are full before you take out that pheo. That is to say, intravascularly full. Make sure you load up the tank before you take these out. Here's another anatomy mnemonic, but you have a medial and you have a lateral pectoral nerve. What innervates what? Well, medial, the word has an M in it. So M for both major and minor 
pectoralis muscles. So what about the lateral pectoral nerve? Well, that innervates the pectoralis major. So the major requires two sources of innervation because it's a bigger muscle. That's how I remember it. All right, here's one that harkens back to step one, but small cell uh, lung cancer. Uh, what are the perineoplastic syndromes associated with it? So write down three A's, and that'll help you remember uh, first ACTH, second ADH, and finally, antibodies, uh, specifically anti-calcium antibodies, which produces Lambert-Eaton syndrome. On the other hand, we've got squamous cell carcinoma, so that'll be three C's instead of A's. And what is this supposed to stand for? Well, C for central, those centrally located. Uh, C for cigarettes, so they are associated with smoking. And then finally, C for hypercalcemia, and uh, that's a result of, you may recall, PTHRP, or parathyroid hormone-related peptide. All right, moving right along. Uh, the medicines that you would give for testicular cancer. So remember the phrase, uh, eradicate ball cancer, EBC. So E for etoposide, B for bleomycin, and C for cisplatin. And what exactly is the indication? It would be for seminomatous germ cell tumors with either bulky retroperitoneal disease or uh, disseminated METs, uh, or non-seminomatous germ cell tumors uh, that are stage two or greater. All right, here's one I remember all the way from step one. So tip and ped. So T, tibial nerve, is responsible for foot inversion and plantar flexion, whereas P, the perineal nerve, is responsible for eversion and dorsiflexion. And furthermore, I remember tiptoes. So if you have a tibial nerve injury, you won't be able to stand on your tiptoes anymore. And I remember dropped. So if you have a perineal nerve injury, you'll have drop foot. And along the same vein of peripheral anatomy, we've got the mnemonic DAB and PAD. So what this tells you is the dorsal interossei, you know, those intrinsic hand muscles, are responsible for abduction of your fingers, whereas P, your palmar interossei, are responsible for adduction. All right, as long as we're doing all this, uh, I figure we get this one out of the way, an old step one-ism here, uh, mead loaf. So we remember that the ulnar nerve is responsible for innervating all of the hand intrinsic muscles, with the exception of the loaf muscles, so the median nerve innervates the loaf muscles. So that would be the lateral two lumbricals, the opponens brevis, the abductor pollicis brevis, and the flexor pollicis brevis, basically like the thumb muscles. Okay, next up, the difference between benzodiazepines and barbiturates. They're both GABA agonists, but what's the difference? So this one comes from our uh, viewer, Adam Crane, in the YouTube comments. Thank you for this one, Adam. Uh, he remembers this by saying he cruises around frequently in his Benz, his Mercedes Benz, uh, and he wants to stay at the bar for a long time. So benzodiazepines will need to be dosed more frequently than barbiturates, and barbiturates last long. Moving on, the vagus nerve anatomy. Uh, if you know what LARPing is, then you'll find this one pretty hilarious, but uh, that's what you write down. You write down LARP. So left vagus travels anteriorly on the esophagus, and the right vagus travels posteriorly. Moving on, how to access the esophagus in the neck and the chest. So if you're in the military, you've got a friend in the military, or honestly, if you've seen a military movie, you'll know left, right, left, you know, like you're marching. So that's the order. If you're trying to get the upper third of the esophagus, make a left neck incision. The middle third of the esophagus, make a right thoracotomy. And the lower third of the esophagus, make a left thoracotomy. Okay, MELD score. Always pesky. You gotta remember what components go into it. So just remember the mnemonic BIC, B-I-C. All objective lab values. B for bilirubin, I for INR, and C for creatinine. And the child Turcotte Pew score, this one's a little more complicated. I remember a bear. I think child Turcotte Pew, Pooh, like Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh's a bear. So A for ascites, B for bilirubin, and uh, E for encephalopathy. Another A for albumin, and R for INR. This next mnemonic is for Crohn's disease. So Crohn's affects the guts, right? So G for uh, granulomas, U for ulcerations, T for transmural, and S for skip lesions, as well as strictures. All right, remembering the Cantrell pentology. Kind of difficult, but remember scoped. 
So S for sternal anomalies, C for cardiac anomalies, O for omphalocele, P for uh, pericardial abnormalities, and D for diaphragm abnormalities. All right, this next one, we got some pretty good feedback. Uh, it is all about port placement uh, for laparoscopy in pregnancy. So there are three trimesters, so we're gonna draw three little like, uh, you know, X, Y axes here. And it's supposed to represent the abdomen. So in the first trimester, everything's pretty much normal because the uterus isn't very big. So uh, normal port placement, suprapubic, left lower quadrant. As we move through the trimesters, we just kind of rotate the X's clockwise. So now, second trimester, we'll have a port in the left lower quadrant and a port in the right lower quadrant. And finally, third trimester, we'll have a port in the right lower quadrant as well as the right upper quadrant. All right, so now we're moving on to congenital uh, left to right and right to left shunts. So no mnemonic for the left to right shunts. I think those are pretty straightforward. Atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, and uh, patent ductus arteriosus. But the right to left defects, how to remember those? So just remember the five T's. So that would be tricuspid atresia, transposition of the great vessels, total anomalous pulmonary venous return, tetralogy of Fallot, and finally truncus arteriosus. And speaking of tetralogy of Fallot, uh, this one is a classic. Proof. So the elements of the tetralogy are pulmonary stenosis, right ventricular hypertrophy, overriding aorta, and a ventricular septal defect. Here's another mnemonic that I love, uh, parathyroids, where to find them, what are their relative locations? So I draw a little cross here, superior, inferior, medial on the left, and lateral on the right. The horizontal axis represents your inferior thyroid artery, and that uh, vertical axis represents the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Then I draw a circle in the uh, top right, and another circle in the bottom left. So what does this represent? The top right is the superior parathyroid, and that's going to be located superior to the ITA and lateral to the recurrent laryngeal. And then on the other hand, the inferior parathyroid will be found inferior to the ITA and medial to the recurrent laryngeal. Okay, the ulnar artery and the radial artery, which one supplies which arch? So U uh, in ulnar, there's a U in superficial, so it's the ulnar artery that supplies the superficial arch of the palm. All right, I use this next one all the time, but we're talking about cystic pancreatic lesions. So the age of the patient can be a clue about what the lesion likely is. So write down daughter, mother, and grandmother. So daughter, young woman, uh, likes to go to spin classes, stay fit, so spin, a solid pseudopapillary epithelial neoplasm. Mother, M, for mucinous cystic neoplasm, and grandma is the last one, serous cystic neoplasm. So this is probably just me, but I sometimes have a hard time remembering the components of triple and quadruple therapy for H. pylori. So for triple therapy, I think TACO. You know, TACO is going to make my belly hurt. T for triple therapy. A stands for uh, amoxicillin. C for clarithromycin. And O for omeprazole. For quadruple therapy, I think of uh, please make tummy better. <laughs> So P for your PPI, like omeprazole, M for metronidazole, T for tetracycline, and B for bismuth. All right, this is the last one. We're almost there. So the topical creams for burn treatment. There's silver nitrate, maffinide acetate, and SSD. What are the side effects? Let's start with silver nitrate and maffinide acetate. So silver nitrate, nitrate, has the N and the A. So NA, hyponatremia. Um, it can be caused by silver nitrate. And because it's got that N in there, I also tr try to remember that it does not penetrate eschars very well. Maffinide acetate, this one's easy, MA for metabolic acidosis. Never miss that one. And then silver sulfadiazine. What are the side effects here? Well, it's a sulfa drug, right? So hopefully we remember from step one days that that means it won't react very well for people who have G6PD deficiency and it will also cause leukopenia. All right, guys, that is it. What more can I say? Uh, watch this video right before you take the app site, and uh, hopefully some of these things will stick. Good luck, and dominate the day.